Uh, normally we say our numbers are down. I don't know what you call today. Our numbers are way, way down today. Do you have a great many who are out sick? And so uh, we need to continue to pray with them. But I also see some new faces. I see some people that I don't even know. So I'm glad you're here. Hope you filled out one of those visitors cards. And uh, glad that you came and worshiped with us today. I got a call early this morning from a crying Lainey Hensley. She has a nephew, Randy Yarbrough. Randy and Deanna have been here before for services, and they've struggled so hard to have a baby. And they finally did get pregnant, but this morning she had to go down to the emergency room. The baby was born very premature, 18 ounces, I think is what she said didn't survive a half an hour and so very tough time for that family and uh, that impacts of course a lot more than just the parents although obviously it's very tough on the parents but grandparents and aunts and uncles and everybody so please be praying for that family as they're going through a really tough time if you are visiting with us you may not know that inside the bulletin is an outline of the sermon and so if you'll get that out, there's two outlines. The one that's on the top, when you open it up, that's the one we're going to do this morning. And then the other one is for this evening. So it should match this title that's on the screen in front of you. Is your faith working? And then more importantly, if you will get out your Bible and turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Normally when I preach, I stay in one book of the Bible. I'm going to break that rule this morning. We're going to look at many books, but we're going to stay on the same topic and that is faith, and I want to talk to you about, is your faith working? As you're going to see, that question has two meanings. By the end, you'll understand. But I want to talk to you about your faith and how it works in a very practical way. I may not share anything with you that you didn't know this morning, but sometimes it's good to review some of those, those old traditional baseline teachings uh, just to get back and kind of refresh our, our minds of those, those baseline things to build on. So, with that in mind, we'll get to our first point. And the point is that I want to make is that faith is required to receive grace. If you don't have faith, you don't have grace. And I'm going to show you that from Scripture. That Scripture, number one, is Ephesians chapter 2. A passage that was just read for us a moment ago. Let's read it again together. We'll just read uh, verses 4 through 7 to begin with. It says, But God, being rich in mercy because of His great love, and I'm sure Paul, when he wrote it, wanted it to be read that way, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with Him, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come He might show the surpassing riches of His grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Notice in that first verse, he says, God is so rich in mercy because of his great, great love for us. You know, God loves us, and he wants us to receive his grace. Let's be clear about that from the beginning. God wants for you to have his grace. That is his desire. I put up a scripture here that you probably know by heart, John 3, 16, the, one of the most popular verses. I, I've heard this is the second most popular verse now in the Bible. The most popular is judge not lest you be judged. That's kind of taken over. But John 3, 16 used to be the most popular. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God loves so much, He sent His Son to offer up to us eternal life. But we have to understand something about grace. Number two, grace is granted only to those who 
believe in him. In other words, God's grace is out there. It's available to anyone. You can have God's grace, but you have to believe in him. Before we get back to Ephesians, look at John chapter 1, verse 12. I'll just put this one up here for you. It says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. And so, in order to be a child of God, to have that right, you have to believe. If you don't believe, you don't have the right to become a child of God. So our belief, our faith, is crucial for us receiving the grace of God. And the way it was explained to me, I'm going to use an old illustration. Maybe this will help you. Think of grace as the water that quenches your thirst. Let's say that you are very, very thirsty. Maybe you were out on one of these hot Oklahoma days, which we've been having a lot of here lately, and I was out mowing the lawn yesterday, and it was just exhausting. Had to do the weeding. I don't mind mowing, to be quite honest with you. It's that weed eating I can't stand. But I sure love the way it looks when you're done. But anyway, I'm out weed eating and I'm mowing and it's very, very hot and I'm wanting some water. And so I go in and I turn on the faucet and that's where the water comes from. Well, think about grace is the water. That's what really quenches your thirst. But the faucet is the way that you receive the water. I know most people don't drink out of the faucet anymore, so that's how old this illustration is. That's back in the day. Remember, we used to open up the faucet and put your, your head under it and get a drink. But, but he, think about it as this is, faith is, is like the faucet. The faucet doesn't quench your thirst. The, the faith doesn't save you. Grace is what saves you. If you stayed right here in Ephesians, look again at what he says in verse, uh, verse 5, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. He doesn't say by faith you have been saved. Grace is the thing that we're striving for. That's what we want to have. And we cannot have that without faith. All right, now we're going to go to our second point here, B. Your good works cannot save you. Your good works are unable to save you. Number one under that, looking back in Ephesians chapter 2, and the first verse is going to uh, confirm our first point that faith is required to receive grace. Look at verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. You should do good things. You were created in Christ Jesus for good works. That's what God made you to do. But as you're doing those good works, understand something. Those works don't save you. Christianity is unique from every other religion in the world in this sense. We don't do good works to earn our nirvana, our reward, whatever it is and whatever religion that is. We do it as a response to having already received the goodness and the reward. You notice that when Paul was talking there about, in, uh, back up to verse 6, he says, and he raised us up with him. Notice he's not saying that to people who are dead. He's saying that to people who are alive. He has already done this. He's already raised us up. He's already given us our reward and seated us with him in the heavenly places. He's not saying after we die and go to heaven. He's saying right now we're seated with God. We have the reward. It's, it's like it's in hand already before we die. The reward is given first, and then we do good works as a result of receiving the reward. But our good works cannot save us. Here's, here's the way this flows. And uh, when we sin... 
We fall short of the glory of God. So that's what goes in your blanks. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Let me do a little survey here. I want you to, just for a moment, just put your pen down for a second. Think of how many people you know. Get in your mind a number, whatever that might be. 100, 600, 6,000, I don't know. How many people do you know? Now, out of all of that list, how many of them have made it through this life without sinning? Count them up. How many? George is going like one, yeah. Okay, he doesn't count. <laughs> you cheater, you. Okay. Yeah, we know him. Other than that, do you know a single person that has never sinned? Isn't that amazing? Do you know the Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God? That is incredible. Nobody gets through this world without sinning except one. Only one has ever done that. The rest of us have sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. And so if you're a sinner today, welcome to the crowd, okay? You're in the right place. That's why we're here, because we're sinners in need of a Savior. All have sinned. All of us have sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. None of us are worthy within ourselves to stand in the presence of God. I hope you, you got that point. All right. Number two. So you need to understand God cannot have fellowship with sin. We see this in the book of 1 John. So if you flip over there, 1 John chapter 1. Lots of verses we could look at. To, to prove this point, but this is one of my favorites just because I love the book of 1 John. 1 John chapter 1, and look at verse 5 with me. This is the message we have heard from Him, meaning God, and announced to you. We've heard it from Him, we announced to you. God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. Now, I need to explain what that means. God is light. Light means purity. Because darkness is sin. So light is purity. So when the Bible says God is light, that means He is absolutely purity. There is no darkness whatsoever in God. God doesn't lie. God doesn't uh, cheat you. God doesn't get jealous. None of those things are qualities of God. Only goodness. Only righteousness. So here is an absolutely pure, perfect God. And then verse 6 says, Now if we say we have fellowship with Him, meaning with God, and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So if light means purity, dark means sin. So if we're walking in darkness, we're walking in sin, right? So if we claim to have fellowship with God and we're walking in sin, we are lying. What is the lie? The lie is that we're in fellowship with God. That's not true. You are not in fellowship with God if you are walking in darkness. Now that's what the Bible says. Why is that statement true? Because here is a perfect God, and here you are with this ugly, blotchy stain of sin on you. How can you have fellowship with a perfect God? You can't. In and of yourselves. Now, we'll, we'll get to the good news here in a little bit. But you've got to understand this bad part first. The bad part is you within yourself, I don't care how many good things you do from this moment on, you cannot save yourself. Do you understand that? There's no good deed that you could do that would earn eternal life. And I know that passage in Ephesians chapter 2 that we read is used to say, well, okay, then baptism doesn't count because baptism is a work. P please. Baptism is not a work that you do to earn eternal life. Baptism is what you do in obedience to God because he tells us to do it. And that's when you receive eternal life. But it's not a work we do to earn Ephesians 2 is talking about doing a work. Okay, well, I've been bad, so I'm going to do 100 good things because that will offset this bad thing, and then I'll get go to heaven. If that's your mindset, I'm about to blow your mind. <laughs> that's not going to work. It cannot work. You cannot save yourself. 
You are here because you have sinned and you need a savior, period. And I don't care how good you are. And I know, I know I'm talking to good people, all right? I understand that. I'm looking at this room. I'm seeing some very good people. But you ain't perfect, are you? <laughs> You're not perfect. And you need a savior. Just as much as the person that you think is a lowly, horrible, rotten, terrible person, you need salvation just as much as that person does. Do you understand that? We all have sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. We all need a Savior. God cannot have fellowship with sin. That's impossible. All right. Let's go on to number three here. Therefore... Our good deeds will not earn us salvation. Now I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 64. I want you to see this verse. Isaiah chapter 64. So just about the time you're thinking, oh man, I'm doing pretty good. I've done all these wonderful things. Uh, just step back and read this verse if you need a little dose of humility. Because Isaiah chapter 64 verse 6 says... For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment, and all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. All of your good deeds, all the wonderful things that you have done, when you take those into the presence of God on Judgment Day and say, Here, God, I should just be saved because of this. You know what God thinks of those? Those are dirty rags. Those are filthy garments there. Those mean absolutely nothing. Now, I'm obviously not saying we shouldn't do good deeds. But I'm saying your good deeds won't save you. Do you understand that? I don't care how good you are. You cannot be saved without Jesus Christ. Okay. Let's go on to our, our point C here. So, without works, you don't have saving faith. I've, I've impressed upon you, you need faith to receive this grace. Let's talk about what kind of faith that needs to be. Without works, you don't have a saving faith. Now, we've got to go to the book of James for this point, so turn to James. I apologize again for moving you around in the Bible, but I think it's important for you to see. I know I preach a lot from one pass or one uh, book of the Bible, but it's also important to see how the whole Bible flows together. Amen? Isn't that great to see? All these passages work together to, to show the same point. In James chapter 2, and we'll start in verse 14. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Well, show me your faith without works. I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, and by the way, foolish fellow, that's as strong as the Bible gets. Remember, the Bible doesn't cuss. Okay? So to be called a foolish fellow, that's pretty strong. You foolish fellow, you, you one who thinks that you can have these, this great faith, but I don't have to have works. Well, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works. And as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says that Abraham believed God, 
and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works who when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. It's great that you have faith. That's wonderful. I'm glad you have faith. I'm glad that you believe in Jesus Christ this morning. But understand that if your faith is not bringing about a change in your life, if there's not works backing up your faith, is the faith really there? Now understand there's different degrees of faith, different levels of faith. I actually wrote a book on that, all right? There are different levels of faith that we can achieve. There's faith where we just say, okay, I, I intellectually acknowledge Jesus was a real person. He really walked on the earth. He really was the Son of God. He really was uh, crucified and resurrected. I believe all that stuff. Verse 19 says, good. That's great. You're right up there with the demons. <laughs> the demons believe that, right? Does that mean they're saved? You see, just believing is not the goal here. I want to impress upon you this morning that, that your faith needs to develop to such a point that you do something about it. Now, the works is not what saves you. I think I've driven that point home, haven't I? But if you have faith and, and there's, it's not producing any works, is, is the faith really there? James says, you, you show me the, your faith without works, I'll show you my faith by what I do. In other words, real faith is backed up by actions. It follows through. That thing that God is telling you to do right now, if you have faith, you'll go do it. That thing that's burning in your heart, maybe it's a scripture you read this week, or maybe it's something that uh, God uh, uh, spoke through another individual to tell you, you need to work on this. You need to repent of this sin. You need to start doing this thing you're not doing. Whatever that thing is, if you really have faith, you'll do it. Or you'll stop doing that, that thing you're not supposed to be doing. Faith is backed up by actions. My point here, number one, it does no good to believe in God if your belief does not press you to action. If it doesn't make you do something. He asked the question in verse 14, can that faith save him? If you have faith and it's not pressing you to action, can that faith save you? Sad answer to that question. No. That faith cannot save you. You need the type of faith that makes you do something. Because 17 says, even so faith, if it has no works, is dead. That means it's useless. It accomplishes nothing. Faith is followed up by actions. Number two, you have a portion of faith, but it won't save you. Now, I, I'm not faulting you for having faith. I mean, that's great that you have faith, but build on that. Take it to the next level. Step up your faith. Say, okay, now I believe. Now it's time for me to do something about this belief. I don't want to be just, just a, another person who lives life. Okay, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Yeah. And then day to day I'm living for the world and then come in here on Sunday morning and, and try to be spiritual for an hour. <laughs> That's not Christianity. Real Christianity is, is, a, is a life religion. It's about what we do beyond the walls of this church building. It is backed up by our actions every day. You need to be a Christian 24-7. It's not just a, a hat you put on when you come here. 
But Christianity is something that you do every day. That's what your faith is. Faith is something that you live out every single day. People see it, or they should be able to see it. There should be evidence. If you were accused of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Or would people say, he's a Christian? I had no idea. How terrible. People say, oh yeah, I know he's a Christian. That's, that's the reaction. Oh yeah, I know she's, in, she's uh, definitely a follower of Christ. That is obvious. I can tell by the way she lives, and I can tell by the way she talks. That's what you want to hear. Faith should be backed up by action. Number three, Bible characters backed up their faith with actions. He gives two examples. The first one is Abraham. Abraham loved his son Isaac. They had been trying for so long for, he's 100 years old. <laughs> She's 90. They've been trying a long time to have a baby. They had long given up on having a child. And God blessed them with the child Isaac. And then God comes to him and says, I want you to take your boy. I want you to take him up on the altar and I want you to sacrifice him to me. Now just put yourself in Abraham's shoes for just a minute. How eager would you be to do that? Would you maybe be thinking, well, you know, God really doesn't, he never asked for human sacrifices. This, this really can't be the voice of God. Wouldn't you be kind of rationalizing something like that in your mind? Or, or would you be thinking, you know what, uh, maybe God just kind of had a, a, a brain lapse there. I think I'll give him time to change his mind. You know, the Bible says that Abraham got up early the next morning. I would have stalled to about noon at least, don't you think? No. Early the next morning he got up, he did exactly what God told him to do to the point he had the knife raised over his son. And God stopped his hand. Now that's faith. It's backed up by action. Rahab. Rahab was a prostitute. She was one of those where that, that most of us say, oh man, it's a bunch of sin in her life. She believed God. When those spies arrived in the land, go back and read the account. When those spies arrived, she says, I know that God is with you guys. I've heard what your God has done for you. I want to be on your side. I want God to have God's favor. And they said, well, if you really do, here's some things you need to do. And she did those things. Her faith was backed up by her actions. And my question to you this morning is, does your lifestyle back up your faith? We, uh, we just need to understand... Without the works, you really don't have the kind of faith that can save you. And I want you to be saved. And God wants you to be saved. God wants to give you His grace. But if there is no avenue there to, to put that grace through, if the faith is not there, the kind of faith that is active, God just shakes His head. He says, I can't, I can't do anything about that. Until you open up and you say, I'm going to have that kind of faith, that I'm willing to let you move me and stir me and you tell me what to do and I'll repent of these sins. I'm going to get those out of my life and I'm going to start doing the things you've commanded me to do. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to pray. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to share my faith. I'm going to love my neighbor as myself. I'm going to do the things you've commanded me to do. All right. D. Back up your faith with obedience, and I mean obedience to God's Word. Let's talk about that. Number one, we're going to read about a man who was seeking salvation in Mark chapter 10. And everything that we've talked about this morning up to this point, I, I think you'll be able to see how this comes to life in a very practical way in a real person who really did come to Jesus and talk to him. And look what he says. Let's start in Mark chapter 10, verse 17. He says, as he was setting out on a journey, now that he would be Jesus, a man ran up to him 
knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Wow, this is off to a good start, isn't it? What do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Verse 18, and Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. Looking at him, Jesus felt love for him. Don't miss that line. That's, underline that in your Bible. Jesus felt love for him. He's not put off by this man at all. He felt love for him and he said, One thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But at these words he was saddened. He went away grieving for he was one who owned much property this man is seeking salvation he comes up says what do I need to do Jesus he's fallen on his knees before Jesus imagine he's prostrate what do I need to do Jesus to be saved you just tell me have you kept the commandments don't murder don't steal don't he says I've kept those since I was a boy now I don't know if he had or not, but, but if he had, that, that's pretty impressive. This is a good person, right? Jesus looked at him and loved him. But Jesus can look into the heart. He can look into your heart this morning. He can know exactly what you need to hear. And he told this man, you need to go sell all your possessions and give them to the poor. Now, you read the entire Bible, there's not another person that Jesus asked to do that. Why that man and why his wealth? Because that man had one thing that was going to keep him out of the kingdom. And Jesus says, if you'll get past that one obstacle, you're going to be doing great. My question to you is, what is that one thing for you? What is that one thing where you draw the line with God? Say, I'll follow you, God. I'll give you everything but this. And now that's, that's off limits. Because as soon as you do that, you know what God does? He says, that's what I want. That right there. That's what you need to go deal with. And when you deal with that, you come follow me. This man went away sad. Number two, Jesus challenged him to back up his words with his actions. Number three, one thing kept him from receiving eternal life. One thing. His money. Isn't that sad? He went away grieving because he knew. He knew the consequences of not surrendering it all. We sing that song, don't we? I surrender all. Do you mean that when you sing it? I surrender all. There is no place I'm drawing a line in the sand with you, God. You have it all. You have my time. You have my money. You have my job. You have my family. You have my strengths. You have my weaknesses. It's all yours, God. I offer it all up to you. I surrender all. Here's a man who says, I'll surrender all but one thing. Don't ask me for my money. Don't ask me for my money. And he went away sad because he had great wealth. Fourth and final point. Do your works confirm that you have faith? If we look at your life, does it confirm the faith is there? Or does it say, no, the faith is just there in pretense. It's really not there. I started with, uh, with uh, this title, and I want to put this back up here one more time. Is your faith working? Now, I want you to see now, that has two meanings, doesn't it? I could mean, is your faith working for you? Is it, is it, is it doing good for you? Or, is your faith working? In other words, does your faith make you work? Does it cause you to do works for God? Good things. 
Because if your faith is not working, it's probably because your faith is not working. Did you get that? If you didn't, then I don't know why you're here. No. <laughs> That's the point. If your faith is not working, it's probably because your faith is not working. You don't have a working faith. And it's time to make a change right here and right now. Faith is amazing. It can do wonderful things if you will let it. But you have to let go. You have to let God have control. Does he have control right now in your life? We're going to sing this song of invitation, Pierce My Ear. If you need to respond, if you've not been letting God lead you the way you know you should, maybe you as a Christian need to say, I need to strengthen my faith. Or maybe you don't even have faith. Maybe you need to receive Christ. You can believe, you can repent of your sins, you can be baptized into Christ today. If that's your desire, please let us know as we stand and sing.